As the easternmost state in the United States, Maine is most closely associated with its majestic coastline. A beautiful landscape, dotted with lighthouses, picturesque rocky cliffs where the waves crash, and quaint New England towns filled with fresh seafood like lobster. When one moves away from the coast, what is found inland and to the north is something quite different. There lies a vast wilderness that is relatively untamed, aside from logging roads cutting through the mountains and the vast sprawling forests. Maine's unofficial state motto is Vacation Land, but it is officially called the Pine Tree State, and for good reason. Maine is the most forested state in the entire United States, at 90% forested. With a population of just over 1.3 million, most of this population lives in the southwestern part of the state, towards the coast and in the Portland area. This leaves much of the northern territories of the state sparsely populated and completely wild. In fact, a large swath of northern Maine is by far the least populated area in the United States anywhere east of the Rocky Mountains. While lacking in human population, these woodlands are populated with fauna both large and small. There is up to an estimated 36,000 black bears residing in Maine. The state's moose population is the largest in the United States outside of Alaska, with an estimated 75,000 eastern moose. Ample resources allow these huge animals to thrive relatively undisturbed, which then brings us to the question at hand, Sasquatch. Maine has long been overlooked when it comes to this topic. But in recent years, more reports have emerged and a rich history of older stories have been brought forward. Bigfoot in Maine is probably one of the state's biggest secrets up until this point. Um, I think until, until Finding Bigfoot showed up a few years ago to talk to people about it, most people didn't think about it. But as soon as you start talking to people about it, you find that there are actually a fair number of people sprinkled through the population who have had encounters that don't match any of the large mammals that are in, endemic to the state. This last year, I've heard more reports than, than I have in, in 20 years. I mean, you've gone from like pulling teeth with people to people, I mean, I can't keep up with emails and texts and I mean, just like identifying footprints or, or they want to tell me either their story or their relative's story. We get a lot of that, I mean, it's a lot of the oral reports. The thing that, about Maine that, that's appealing, let's say, to Sasquatch, is it's very wooded. It goes right on up into Quebec and a little bit into New Hampshire and Vermont. It's so much so that if you have occasional reports of Bigfoot and Sasquatch, it's not really seen as too abnormal uh, because the woods are dark and deep, as they say, and there seems to be something in there besides the mystery cats and the giant snakes and the other things that we hear about there's bigfoot reports i think maine has uh has obviously a lot of unsettled territory or sparsely settled territory it has lots of great food sources both flora and fauna it has tons of water sources which is a major issue and uh ground cover in some ways, Maine has always been a wilderness frontier. From the days of the Native Americans, to the colonial days and the beginnings of the logging and timber industry as far back as 1634, to the long history of hunting, fishing, and trapping in the state, there has always been humans utilizing this land and traversing it. In that time, there have been quite a few strange stories floating around regarding what we today might refer to as Bigfoot-like. Well, I think that traditionally, if you look at the older cases of Bigfoot and Sasquatch, you'll find a whole native and first person's lore that is really encompassed in what we call Wendigo. And Wendigo are a form of Bigfoot, Sasquatch, that compared to the Western version, are much more aggressive. So aggressive that they oftentimes talk about um, them attacking dogs, attacking humans, in a more uh, 
consistent way than they do out west. You know what the one that, that I'd never heard of is Blackman Ridge, which is up by Lincoln. The Penobscot avoided that area because it was a, a tribe of black men. And they, they were known as the warriors of death. And I found this by reading the dictionary of uh, names and places in Maine. I mean, it was the most obscure book. That was the definition for Blackman Ridge. I've looked into it a little deeper. And, and there's something there. It's a cre another creepy area. It's, it's one of those things where the Penobscots and many natives, like unfortunately, I feel like their histories were, were kind of stamped out. I was told a long time ago that's where the secret was. You pay attention to the natives and you know what, they've been here all along. But we just ignore it. One curious story from 1886 that spread far and wide at the time told of hunters camped 100 miles north of Moosehead Lake that encountered a 10-foot tall wild man with 7-foot long arms and hair all over his face and body. One of the three hunters was discovered dead and the other two went back to town to recruit reinforcements who located the wild man and apparently killed him. The story circulated at the time, but nothing definitive ever originated from this wild tale. Back in the um, late 1800s, there was actually one of the first sightings reported in Maine was done in Waldeboro, that's my hometown, where a gentleman supposedly actually caught a juvenile one. I've seen the old newspaper articles, I've got the name, so I need to get to the town office and see if I can talk to somebody and find out if there's any relatives that I can speak to that might have more information on this story because it's one that I find a little odd at times, but kind of neat too at the same time. So it's just, yeah, that one stands out to me a lot. The International Cryptozoology Museum, located in Portland, Maine, is one of a kind. Cryptozoology is considered to be the study of hidden or undiscovered animals. The subject of cryptozoology encompasses far more than just cryptids like Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, to include previously thought extinct creatures like the coelacanth, or out-of-place animals like mountain lions in the eastern United States. The museum takes its role seriously in conveying the natural, cultural, and real-world implications of the subject of cryptozoology. But even in a museum dedicated to cryptozoology, Bigfoot dominates, both in impact and simply in stature. The museum was founded by renowned author and influential cryptozoologist Lorne Coleman. Being based in Maine, Coleman has certainly been privy to a variety of Bigfoot reports in the Pine Tree State. Well, my favorite report of all the reports is the cluster of reports that happened in Durham, Maine in 1973. In July of that year, they had some kids riding their bikes in a cemetery, and they ran home and they told their mother that they saw this bipedal creature, you know, a creature on two legs running through the cemetery that occasionally would go down on all fours ran very rapidly. The next day, the mother who, you know, thought, well, these are just kids playing, she actually saw it. And then before you knew it, the police, the newspapers, different kinds of strangers would show up looking for it. The press actually coined it the Durham Gorilla because the, the reports were so gorilla-like. You know, not even, they didn't even think of Bigfoot. They really thought, more like a gorilla, more like an ape. I've actually ran into people, you know, antique shopping or looking in the woods or in the museum, people would come in and they say, oh, you know, I knew about that or I saw it or things like that would happen because it's such a, an, a, a vibrant story and people really still share the details of it. Growing interest and awareness of the Bigfoot topic in Maine is in part thanks to the presence of the museum, but also to those researching the topic further and compiling accounts from far and wide. 
Author Michelle Soulier has spent the better part of a decade working on her recently published book, Bigfoot in Maine. I interviewed over 20 people for the book. Uh, I think there's 20 in the book, and those are all really interesting accounts that kind of add a piece to the puzzle of what's going on around the state. Uh, but the people I have talked to, uh, most of them have had kind of accidental encounters. Uh, there's a lot of that. Uh, there are a few people who live or hike regularly in certain areas that notice patterns over time. So there's a little bit of that too. There's And there are some areas that seem to have a lot more activity, um, even though they're fairly close to population centers, um, which surprises a lot of people to find out about. But it's, it's, it's been way more interesting than I thought it was to, going to be, honestly. I thought I would come up with a lot of historic stuff that was kind of questionable and not so much eyewitness accounts. Maine-based filmmaker and cryptozoological researcher Nate Brislin has been compiling reports as well as interviewing folks for his documentary titled Eyes from the Pines, The Pine Ape Project. The term I've come up with for Maine Bigfoot is pine apes. So I'm hoping that'll catch on. Yeah, it goes over you know several people's encounters, investigators. I've interviewed uh, a cultural anthropologist from one of the universities here in Maine. Yeah, it just sort of goes over encounters and we get you know, we found some things ourselves. Nate has himself had some interesting experiences at a rural family cabin. Well, it is, it's in central Maine, which is where, which is a big hot spot for um, Maine, uh, reported Maine Bigfoot encounters. And since I was younger, my, myself, my family have had just these strange experiences. My mom and I were sitting around a campfire right outside the cabin. And I think it was around midnight. A lot of things happen around midnight for some reason and we just, in the middle of the woods, we just randomly start hearing just wood knocks, just random wood hitting wood. And we were like, okay, there's no one else around here. That's really the first thing that happened. I was like, okay, that's kind of strange. Something strange is going on. And then another one of the encounters happened at night, which around midnight, um, I was walking, the, the cabin's along a dirt road, and I was walking along with a spotlight looking for, just looking for animals and stuff, because there's deer, bear, everything out there and I hear this big animal to the left of me walking up the road. Something huge just forcing its way through the brush, like not trying to be quiet. Between us and the forest is a, is a creek and we hear it, we're, we start to hear it, we hear it going like shh, like, um, and we're like, oh, it's a moose or something like that. And then we hear it step into the water, right? And it's pitch dark, we have our lights. Um, we don't see it. This was very clearly like, someone walking at the beach in shallow water where it's like they step in, out, in, out of the water. So it was definitely something bipedal, but we heard it, it was just step, step in the water until it went into the brush and down and back into the woods. We have our uh, neighbors who live right next to us. They, they watch our house, they can see our house, or our, our cabin from the, their kitchen window. One time, this was right after we left to actually do an investigation, we left, and I think about a couple days later, our neighbors actually called us and said, so we thought someone was trying to break into the, your camp. And we were like, oh, okay. And they were like, yeah, the person was all, we thought it was a person, they were all, then we noticed they were all dressed in black. So we were like, oh, it's a bear. And then they were like, no, it's not a bear, because they see it stand up and walk across the yard back into the woods. And then they were like, it was a Bigfoot. Most of the research that I do was in an area that's just outside of Bangor. Um, I had a person come to me and um, had some prints that he couldn't explain on his property um, that were right outside of his, his living room window. Um, we went up to check it out and since then I've been up there several times. We've actually come across prints. Uh, two years ago I was able to cast a uh, 17 and a half inch track um, just a half mile from his place. And then in the same spot when we found that, um, I had been up there scouting ahead of time anyways to see where I wanted to actually do some night investigations. And in that area, we, we come across a tree bend. Two weeks prior to that, that tree bend wasn't there. And I kind of took a, a video recording of it, but 
um, besides that 17 and a half, the 17 and a half inch tracks that we found, we also found 15 inch tracks that um, were like three inches into the ground, which we thought was kind of like phenomenal for the area it was at. Even explaining it to the gentleman that, that I, I researched for, it's I can't explain it. I didn't see what did it, but it's it's pretty cool to find, you know, it's evidence like that. When I was in high school, I actually had a, a run-in with something large, but that's where I got the facial description that I've stuck on to. I mean, I saw enough where I, I don't question. Uh, and for years, I, I was trying to prove it and prove it to everybody. Not even so much prove it to myself, but I stopped doing that now. Now I just... I more of just track them. It's like, I know they're here. I know what time of the year they're in a basic area. I, I've been doing it long enough where that's what I got. And I watch, and every year they confirm in one form or another, whether I find tracks, hear about tracks, I can almost pick it, you know? I mean, and you guys are going to the sweet spot. Like, there's no question. With such a rich backdrop of sightings and history in Maine, it only felt right to head into the wilderness of the state and see what we could find. I teamed up with fellow cryptid researchers and filmmakers, Eli Watson and Carrick St. Laurent. We took some advice from one of my favorite researchers, Doug Hycheck. All right, so uh, we're on the phone now with Doug Hycheck, a uh, very respected uh, man in the world of cryptozoology, has done a lot of really interesting stuff, Monster Quest, uh, to say the least. I've uh, been involved in a lot of Bigfoot research, so we figured it would be appropriate to, to talk to Doug. So, Doug, we're heading up to the wilderness of northern Maine looking for Sasquatch. Uh, do you have any tips or recommendations for us? Oh, God, yes. Um, so, as you guys know, <laughs> very unlikely to be able to sneak up on a Bigfoot. And so it's far more likely that they're going to, you know, they're going to come to you guys. Right. I hear this over and over, Alex, where people are, you know, they're in their tent. It's two, three in the morning and they, they hear a wood knock, you know, near their camp. And then they hear, you know, walking in their camp in their really kind of at a disadvantage because, you know, they're not going to be able to go over and unzip the tent. You know, you're going to make a bunch of noise. Whatever's out there is going to flee. And so, to me, one of the things I've always wanted to try personally, and I haven't done it even yet, some surveillance cameras um, and have a monitor inside the tent that you can, you know, keep under a sleeping bag so they don't see any ambient light. Right. Um, and you can then monitor what's going on out there and even have the, the possibility of recording. Is that some gear that you might have, some surveillance cameras? Yeah, yeah, I think what we, we can try that. We can maybe get some kind of a, a home surveillance system mm -hmm. and see if we can rig something up. Yeah. I have, I have one more suggestion, and that's when you get into your camp, you set up your camp, um, before you retire, maybe do, you know, one or two wood knocks. Don't do any screaming. It's really been proven to me that um, there is a huge difference between a Bigfoot vocal and a human vocal. Mm. And to me, maybe doing a couple of wood knocks before you guys retire and that's it. Right. And, you know, the, the really good, solid, hollow, baseball bat sounding wood knocks. Mm. And that's always worked for me. And uh, usually we've had activity almost in the case because that sound carries, you know, it's basically a calling card. Yep, right, right. So that's my last suggestion. No screaming, just do uh, one or two wood knocks. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Hey, guys. Well, have a, have a great trip. Stay safe. Yeah, thank you. We will let you know if anything does or doesn't happen. You'll be the first to know. Okay, sounds good. Talk later. All right, thanks, Doug. As we drove, the tree cover became thicker and more vast. We were heading into the North Main Woods, which is one of the largest areas of wilderness in the U.S. not owned by state or federal authorities. 
It is privately owned and managed, largely by logging companies, but recreational use is allowed for the public, while being highly controlled and regulated. The region covers 3.5 million acres, and there are no towns or paved roads in that area at all. Right as the pavement began to end, we encountered Mount Katahdin. Katahdin stands at 5,269 feet and is the ending place of the famed Appalachian Trail, stretching from Georgia to Maine. Katahdin is a formidable peak that has claimed the lives of many an unprepared hiker. The peak was respected and feared by Native Americans in the region. The Penobscot tribe told of the story of Pomula inhabiting Mount Katahdin, describing it as a man with the head of a moose and the wings and legs of an eagle. Katahdin served as an entry point as we continued to venture even further north. So this is the spot that we pulled up into last night just to camp. We got about another hour, hour and a half up to the actual site where we want to stay for the next few days. But it got pretty late as we were driving up through here. So we decided to just pull off into here and just stay in this area. huge area. Right now we are near Baxter State Park, so we got Mount Katahdin right here. We are in this, we're going to be heading up about an hour or two north into 55 or 56, so this area up here. This whole area, the whole county, I mean it's the size of the state of Connecticut, and has a population of 17,000. Frontier, so about 50. Alright, so there's Mount Katahdin. We drove around here. We're somewhere in this area right now, so we're just gonna keep going north. We're gonna go to Telos Checkpoint for the North Main Woods. We got our map of the North Main Woods here. Least populated area on the entire East Coast. So there's the checkpoint. We drive in, we have this whole area to play with. We got the Canadian border right up here. Roostick County, which is the largest county in Maine, I believe. But uh, a lot of different spots to choose from. There's some primitive campsites all along in there. We're going to pick uh, one that's close to a water source. We got a lot of water in here, so I think that should be pretty interesting. This is around the area last year where I was camping and had some moose run through my camp at 6 in the morning. So let's just be uh, just be ready. Keep your eyes peeled for moose, bear, anything. Let's see what else we can do. So let's do it. We are now going through Telos Checkpoint. Uh, we still have some hours to drive, so we will, uh, it's just woods the rest of the way. That's the last really part of civilization is this little village, and these are just loggers and folks that work with this North Main Woods Association here. Aside from this, it's just gonna be nothing else, so. Wild country.
Oh, there he goes. So, Carrick and Alex uh, left to investigate another possible location that we could stay at. Uh, Alex, due to the dark skies, asked me if I wanted a rain poncho. I said no. Now here I am, without a jacket, without a poncho, and it's raining. I had to place all the camera equipment underneath the table, this picnic table here. I like barely did it. I'm like kind of hunkered down. This is a fallen tree. It is currently my <laughs> my shelter from the rain. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's going pretty well. I just hope there's not too many bugs here. Holy crap, it's really coming down. <laughs> this is amazing. We had to set up our tent and everything in a rush because it was raining, but we are here at the campsite. All right, so we're getting eaten alive out here in Maine. Bugs are crazy, uh, Maine's known for it, but we're just gonna go over kind of the game plan. So we're here for a few days in this spot. All right, let's just talk about equipment and gear real quick. We've got all kinds of drones, obviously cameras, trail cameras. That's mostly gonna be for other wildlife. I mean, we're gonna put that up, see if we have moose. We have moose scat right in camp. Mm -hmm. We've seen moose two bear mm -hmm. already. We have uh, just little flags from Emily of the Forest Fleur. These will be in case we find anything of interest we want to cast later. We obviously have casting material, um, flurs. Carrick, what, what's with this? Right, so what we have here is a live spectrogram system. It's just an app that you can get for your phone or your Chromebook, and it records audio in real time, plays it on the screen as a spectrogram, shows you the frequency have, you know, sounds are happening at, so it'll be really useful for control center listening for sounds around us tonight. So the main thing that we're looking at here is this whole CCTV system. So it's going to allow us to uh, kind of look outside of the tent while we're inside of it and kind of monitor the situation. We have uh, Alex here rigged up this uh, recommendation from Doug Hycheck was just kind of hide one of the cameras inside of a, uh, this is a Doritos bag, just some like trash. So we're going to disguise all of these cameras. They're all small, they have infrared light on them, so uh, they're all going to be disguised in a similar manner somehow. So something we're going to try that we've never really tried before is uh, just putting out some, you know, raw tobacco basically um, out in the woods in a little spot and see if anything's interested in that. You know, maybe that brings something in. Uh, that's something that uh, Michelle Soulier, who wrote Bigfoot in Maine, talks about in her book. Uh, some people in Maine have actually used that to some degree of success according to the stories, you know, using these for Sasquatch kind of habituation encounters, whatever. Uh, might seem kind of silly, but uh, this will probably not appeal to other animals, I would imagine. So we'll see, you know, if you, we were to put out food, maybe bears or other things might be attracted. So we'll see if uh, tobacco might appeal to something like a Sasquatch. I mean, you never know. We're just trying everything until something works. And if it doesn't, so what? You know, we, at least we tried it. So what we have here are some blueberries that we picked up from a local grocery store. They're unfrozen, so they're at least relatively fresh smelling, which is the important part of the scent because what we're going to do is cut open some of these blueberries, leave some whole, and we're going to mix them in and put some on top of a puddle. What will happen is, let's say something caught a whiff of those opened up blueberries and wanted to pick out a few. And let's say that thing had a hand. Even if a deer comes through, it might leave a nose impression. There's plenty of ways that you can capture something eating or picking up something. And of course, our hope is that if there are Sasquatch in this area, they might come by, be tempted by the smell of blueberries, and pick one up, leaving some fingerprint evidence. In Maine alone, 
plenty of the sightings fall within the ranges where Maine grows the most blueberries. There's actually a map that I, I have that demonstrates that. And it's, it's one of the kind of major calling cards that we're noticing in northern Sasquatch sightings is the presence of alleged Sasquatch near blueberry patches. So hopefully these blueberries are a tempting enough offer for anything in the area. Definitely a fresher pile of moose scat. So this is just probably a game trail here, I'd say. Oh, dude, look at this. We're gonna cast this guy. Look at that track. Oh, whoa! Ooh, we gotta check this one. We got a really good slip right here. All right. So we're just gonna put this guy right in here. So we know to come back here. We're gonna cast that big boy. Get that leaf out of the way. It's a beautiful track right there. So, we have this one camera in this bag of chips, a formerly bag of chips. Quick test. Let's yeah. do it. If anything walks near the tent, it'll be seen. Yeah, there you so go. There he goes. And he's gonna pop up over here in a minute. Yep, okay, and then he'll pop up on the other one. We can see him again right there. Boom, right there. Oh, that's excellent. And then that? watch. No, keep going. Keep just going. just come all the way around and come back in. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Look at that. It's okay. You want you want to sit on this one? I don't know if that's producing the volume though. So we're getting rained out here. Already soaking wet. Yeah, how does it feel, Eli? Are you filming this? Yeah. I'm trying to get my jacket out of the rain. He's trying to get his jacket out of the rain. Go for it, buddy. It's a, yeah, give me a sec. Yeah, so we got completely rained out. Hmm. First night in this spot. It's starting to calm down a little bit now. We have the whole camera system set up, so I think we're going to fire that up. Should we wipe them with some? Just hanging out, monitoring the camera. Sit up. So it's morning after a very rainy night. It kept raining throughout the night, but we had our surveillance system running. Uh, but right now it's pretty overcast day. Not too, not too rainy, so that's good. We're in part of this face. What do you think, Eli? I'm gonna be eating pancakes with a spoon. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is, it's like that's pig. moose. It's gotta be moose. Moose, you think so? Yeah, dude, that's huge. We've got moose bone, big old pile of moose scat. I mean, that's not too old either. Mm. 
making our way downtown. We could still cast that one too. We totally can. All right, let's get some mix going. So I'll use my hands. You can see the stack. Might need more water. That yeah, looks like a really good consistency, actually. Feels pretty good. I'm just trying to make sure I get rid of the clumps, you know. So here's the uh, moose, one of the moose tracks we casted. Came out really well. Obviously there's a lot of stuff we gotta clean and let it kind of keep drying, but pretty big moose. So it's probably a, a back leg. Hind, uh, hind hoof that kind of splayed a little bit. Cause you see this, the front ones are seem to be smaller and tighter. So there's a little bit splay and you can really see them. I, mean, I can stick a whole finger in there. So pretty cool to see. All right, well, we're about to head out now. We're going to hike up to the uh, top of a mountain nearby. So just get, let's get our walkies in order. Channel 6 on both. Do you copy? Do you copy? Yes, I do. Perfect. This this will stay with Carrick. So, Carrick, you're going to be in camp. We're uh, just going to hike up, kind of see what's going on in the area, see what we can or can't find. So, yeah, let's uh, let's get to it. Check out all this stuff. I mean, this is another one of those situations where I'll go stand in there. Yeah, go in there. I mean, somebody could argue that, you know, this is a tree structure. Some people would argue that. It looks pretty natural to me. I mean, this whole forest is with these little tiny pines. So I could totally see winter damage snow load up here, how brutal the winter gets. Still kind of cool. Yeah. Look at this. That's just blown over. What it looks like. Yeah. So what do you think of this area, Eli? It's very green, very dense. I, I was just telling you off camera, it's more dense than I thought it was gonna be. Especially compared to, I guess the episode isn't out yet, but when we went to um, the Olympics and right. how dense all of that was, and I just didn't figure the East Coast would be comparable. It's rough, but, man, getting through some of those areas. You see the moose just kind of bulldozing straight through. Yeah, no kidding, man. Some moose are powerful animals. Alex and Eli to Carrick, do you copy? I do indeed, what's up? So we're just about to hop off the logging road and start heading up to the actual peak of the mountain. So we're just, I uh, want to let you know. All right, great. All right, talk to you later. Bushwhack up the mountain was brutal and tiring and took us quite a while, especially given the heat. It became evident how tough getting through the underbrush was and how much of a disadvantage we as humans were compared to the other creatures in the area. A large animal could easily be hiding just mere feet from us in the brush and we would have absolutely no idea. During our hike we came across so much moose sign 
whether it be tracks or scat, that it was actually incredible to know how many of these large and formidable creatures were all around us. We also came upon plenty of black bear sign, as well as the presence of other wildlife. This area, like the millions of acres around it, was teeming with life. That evening, we tried an approach to attempt to stir some interest in the area. We first started by playing some music. I would then deploy onto the pond via kayak, sitting mostly silently and scanning with a FLIR unit, but then also playing the sounds of a human baby crying. They're playing music in the back. Okay, you guys ready for baby sounds? One second here. Actually, yeah, we're ready to go for it. Wow, super creepy echo on that. How does that sound on your end, guys? Sounds really good, dude. I can hear it pretty clearly from here, actually. Yeah, I mean, it's like uh, echoing over here in the lake, so I'm gonna keep doing it. Sit here and listen for a little bit. Did you guys just break like a stick, a campfire stick? Are you guys by the shore by any chance or where are you at? I heard something cracking like sticks in the trees, so I'm gonna keep scanning. It sounded semi near you guys, that's what I was wondering if it was you guys cracking something.
While reviewing the surveillance footage, I noticed something strange moving through the woods behind our camp. While it appears to be a moose, whatever it is, it is quite large. Sadly, the video quality at that distance doesn't do us any favors. I'm just filming you getting the camera right now. Just getting the, uh, the chip, chip camera? Yeah. Literally every single one is us. Every single one. So nothing came through here? No. It looks pretty untouched. Nothing. So we just packed up camp, getting ready to head out. Didn't really have a whole lot happen. A few days here, a lot of moose evidence, other animals. Nothing what we were looking for, but that's often what happens with this subject. Got everything broken down. It's always important to leave no trace when you're in these wild areas, keep them preserved. But um, yeah, until next time, you know, Northern Maine will remain wild. I think we were driving for like five, six hours alone in Maine. Uh, you, you brought up you could fit all of New England inside of Maine. When you see it on the map, it's up in the corner. You're not really thinking, like it's just off to the side almost. Because when I'm picturing the East Coast, anything on the East Coast, I'm picturing completely like urban or suburban. You know, I'm not picturing anything remotely as wild as what's on the West. It's like comparable to the Pacific Northwest, honestly. People, I think, fail to make the correlation between how remote northern New England is and places like the Pacific Northwest. It's a different kind of terrain, but only in slight variations, really. And we have a very, very long history of, of sightings in Maine. So there's no reason at all, I don't think, that, that Maine should not be focused on for, for Sasquatch research. While some will inevitably be angered by the lack of alleged Bigfoot evidence presented in this film, my hope is that by showing the natural beauty of a state like Maine, as well as highlighting the valiant efforts of researchers and enthusiasts alike in sharing their stories, that it will foster an atmosphere where more people are open to sharing their encounters without the fear of ridicule or stigma being attached. Well, I, I think that Mainers are rugged individualists that they don't want to be told what they should and shouldn't believe. They don't want to be told what they saw or didn't see. They don't want to be told how to think. If somebody has a real life experience with it, or they know somebody they trust that has, they're not going to care whether you have a suit on or have government after your name. In my view, Maine has the right ingredients. It deserves a much more in-depth look when it comes to the Sasquatch phenomenon. It seems to be the most underrated place when it comes to the topic.